Welcome to Book Trip Live, a Merrill Moss Media production. Today we're very excited to be speaking with Kermit Roosevelt III, author of legal thriller Allegiance. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kermit. Thanks for having me. And um, Kermit is a law professor at uh, UPenn. Um, he's an expert on constitutional law and a distinguished, a distinguished research fellow at the um, Annenberg Public Policy Center. Kermit is the author of several books, including a novel entitled In the Shadow of the Law, which is also a legal thriller. So to start off, uh, could you talk a little bit about your newest book, Allegiance? Allegiance is historical fiction, um, but it is intended to have some relevance to the current situation. So it's set during World War II. It's set in part in Philadelphia, in part in Washington and the Supreme Court, and also in part in the detention camps to which Japanese Americans were sent during World War II. And the detention of the Japanese Americans is one of the main focuses of the book. So my narrator, my protagonist, is a guy from Philadelphia who, after the Pearl Harbor attack, wants to join up and serve in the military. He can't do that, but then he gets another opportunity, he thinks, to serve his country, working first for the Supreme Court and then for the Department of Justice. He's assigned to work on these Japanese American internment cases and he starts having doubts about what the government is doing. He also uncovers a mysterious conspiracy. There's a murder. That's the less fact-based part of, of the book. But a lot of it is, is very historically accurate. And part of the aim is to teach people about this episode in our history. Mm. So why did you choose this particular era? era? Um, this is a question from Kaz. Um, was it something you just felt drawn to? Um, well, what happened was my, my editor wanted a novel set in the Supreme Court, and I thought it would be difficult to do that in the present day because I didn't want people thinking I was revealing secrets that I'd learned during my clerkship. And my wife came up with the idea of setting in the past. I looked for a historical era that had parallels to what was going on when I started this book, which was actually 2007, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking about then was the U.S. response to September 11th and in particular Guantanamo detentions, because I had just been asked to serve as a constitutional law consultant on a Guantanamo case. So if you look at Pearl Harbor, it's a very strong parallel to September 11th. It's this shocking attack on American soil, striking us in a way we didn't really think was possible. And then you've got the same kind of reaction. You've got a little bit of hysteria. You've got suspicion of people who seem different. And you've got various measures the government takes in response in the name of national security. And the question is, are these justified? Are these wise? Are these the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. So what are you hoping people will take away from this novel? Uh, what was your goal in writing it? My goal in writing it was to inspire people, I guess, to understand that there is a pattern historically that happens with these surprising attacks or these moments of national fear and insecurity, which is we get frightened. We want the government to do something. We want the government to get the bad guys. But when it's difficult to get the bad guys, instead of finding people who are dangerous, the government will often find people who are different. And especially if they look in some way or they resemble in some way the enemy, then we can turn on them instead. And we start thinking of them as not real Americans, in the World War II cases, these were real Americans, or just people we don't have to care about. You see some of that in the aftermath of September 11th, and we decide that you know, maybe they're guilty, maybe they're not. Whatever we do to them in the name of national security, though, is justified if it might make us safer. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So um, Sandra has a question. Um, she says, the book has actual cases examined by the court during the time period in question. What type of research went into something like this? And were you ever worried you were getting things horribly wrong? Well, I wasn't worried about getting the legal things wrong, because I, I am a law professor. Constitutional law is my field. So I'm pretty familiar with Supreme Court decisions. And what I did for that was I read, of course, the opinions that the court issued in the cases. And I read all of the briefs that the parties submitted so on each side in these cases, lots and lots of different people and organizations submitted briefs arguing for, for their position. I read all of those. I read the transcripts of the oral arguments, so what the lawyers actually said before the Supreme Court, the questions the justices asked. And then to the extent that I could, because a lot of this is actually secret, but to the extent that I could, 
I uncovered what the justices said to each other while they were trying to decide these cases. In some cases, the justices' memos to each other are available. And in some cases, there are biographies or autobiographies that discuss some of it. So I, I did a lot of research, and I'm pretty confident about most of the legal stuff. Um, I'm a little bit less confident about my ability to accurately recreate the world of the 1940s. You know, I'm, I may have made some mistakes there. Oh. Well, with this, uh, so you're saying you're a little um, less confident about like the, the actual like fictional world. Is this your first time writing fiction, or I mean, I know you have a previous novel, but um, but prior to the previous novel, were you writing any fiction, or did you have experience with that? I've been writing fiction for a long time. So my, my first novel was published in 2005. That was my first published novel. I'd written probably three other novel length works of fiction before then, but they didn't get published basically because they weren't very good. So mm -hmm. I do have a lot of experience writing fiction and I, I think I've gotten better at it. This was my first attempt writing historical fiction, which I found very difficult because not just in the writing process, but in the revision process, I'll be going through and I think, oh, I'd like a little scene about this, or I'd like to have a character look down at his shoes. And like all of a sudden I'm like, now I have to look at a 1940s clothing catalog to figure out what the shoes would look like. <laughs> so if you're trying to be accurate, it's, it's really pretty difficult. Huh. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, so there's a question here from Bia. Um, she wants to know how long did this book take to write? It must have been a pro uh, process to research and get everything together, which you were just talking about. Yeah, well, I did an enormous amount of research for this book. I did an enormous amount of research on the legal materials, on the political background, on all of the historical figures who appear as real characters. I, I read a biography of every Supreme Court justice. And I did a lot of research into the social world of Philadelphia, which is part of this. and the general home front atmosphere during World War II. So it actually took me eight years. Now that's not all because of the research, it's also because my wife and I had two kids along the way. In fact, my first daughter was born almost exactly when I started writing the book. So I sort of dated as oh, wow. coextensive with her life. And then three years ago we had a son. So that, that definitely slowed things down, both in terms of not having as much time and in terms of being really intensely sleep deprived for a long period of time. <laughs> Which made the work go slower. <laughs> Definitely. So um, there's actually another question here from Bia. Um, she says, you're a former law clerk. Where did that experience come into play when you were writing this book? I'm a former law clerk, both at the DC Circuit and at the Supreme Court. And that experience helped a whole lot in writing the courtroom scenes because my character ends up being a Supreme Court law clerk. He clerks for Justice Hugo Black. So having had the experience of actually working in that setting, I think allowed me to write with more confidence and more accuracy and verisimilitude about that. Mm. Mm. And one more question from Bia. How much of you can be found in this character, your protagonist? There are surely some similarities considering your background. There, well, there are a lot of similarities. So there are some biographical similarities and you know, we both clerked at the Supreme Court. But more than that, there is a sort of emotional similarity. Um, he lives in the 1940s. It's a different world. But the process of character development that he goes through, in part, he's learning to care about people who are different from him, which I hope is not something that I had to learn recently. I suppose I did learn it as a child. But the other thing that happens to him is he starts out very confident that the US government is just and it's going to do the right thing and it's competent and it's not going to make mistakes and he's very trusting of you know the official story that the government puts forth and what various representatives of the government say to him and then as time goes by and he starts learning more he starts becoming more skeptical about the government and that's definitely a process that i went through um, in particular in the work that i did on post september 11th cases because another thing that happens in these reactions to fear, these times of national insecurity is the government will do something and it wants to tell you it's done the right thing. It wants to tell you it's saved you and made you safe. Sometimes it makes mistakes and then it's very, very reluctant to admit those mistakes. And it will often go on and do some pretty abhorrent and shocking things in order to avoid admitting that it's made a mistake. Well, 
There's a very, very interesting question here from Kate. She wants to know what you think would have happened if there was social media back in the um, era where the book takes place. Well, that is a very interesting question. Um, I just don't really know what the overall impact of social media is. So, you know, you can see it doing good things. You can see it doing bad things. Social media provides an, an easy and valuable way for lots of people to get information about mm -hmm. something. So, you know, you would have the trending hashtags, um, Japanese American lives matter, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you'd also have social media on the other side. Social media is a very easy way for people to distort issues. You could mm -hmm. have, you know, viral videos going around that are not actually videos of what they purport to be. So, you know, mm -hmm. you could imagine viral videos of Japanese army troops training and people would say, this is the Japanese Americans. So it gets a lot of information out there. The information it gets out is not necessarily accurate or reliable. And ultimately, I don't know, is, is social media a good thing or a bad thing for public engagement in these important mm -hmm. issues? Mm -hmm. I think it, it remains to be seen. Yeah, it's certainly something fun to, or like interesting to think about what that could have been like. It would have changed a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, um, well, you know, that would be a good alternate history novel. Yeah, what happened right? With Twitter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a good idea. Maybe, maybe your next, your next work. <laughs> um, so there's a question here from Carly. Um, have you met any of the survivors of the camps? Do they know about your book? And um, did they have a response? I have met a couple. Um, there, there are not a lot of people now who were alive during the detention. So the, you know, the, the generation who were adults when they were put in the camps, that, that generation is pretty much all gone. Um, the people who were left were generally young children. And I have met a couple of them. It's a very, very moving experience for me to meet people who actually lived through what I describe in the book. And their reaction generally has been, has been very positive. Um, the, the person that I'm really looking forward to meeting, and I, I am going to meet him, we're going to do an event together, is George Takei, Star Trek's Mr. Sulu, if you know, um, mm -hmm. who was as a child confined in the Tula Lake detention camp mm -hmm. with his family. That was actually one of my other questions, because I know there's a musical coming out um, called Allegiance um, based on George Takei's sort of his life. Um, have you heard of this musical? And what are your what are your kind of thoughts about it? Oh, yeah, I've, I've heard of it. I, I have tickets. I'm planning oh, to go see it. Yeah, oh, great. I, I, you know, I, I was a little bit concerned when I first heard about it because I was afraid that George would not like the fact that I have the same title. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was just we learned about yeah. about the musical um, about a week after we had chosen our title. And I, I was wondering if maybe we were going to have to change it. But the publisher said it was OK. And we actually communicated with George about it. And he said it's sort of a happy coincidence. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm a great admirer of George Takei. Um, so there's a question here from Emily. Um, she said, did you learn anything surprising while researching these cases for your book? I learned an incredible number of surprising things. I think this is a topic that's not actually all that well taught in American history. At least the, the classes that I took, I didn't learn very much about it. I knew sort of the general outlines. But there were lots of things I didn't know. Um, lots of things about the conduct of the government, which was pretty bad in many ways. They actually submitted to the Supreme Court evidence that they knew was false. Um, I didn't know, this is a relatively significant part of the book, I didn't know that Japanese Americans in the camp were encouraged to renounce their citizenship and that those who did under severe psychological pressure were going to be deported. They were going to be sent to Japan after the war. Um, and the idea was we're sending them home, but most of these people were born in the United States and had never been in, in Japan. Um, and they were going to be deported, about 5,000 of them, until lawyers intervened to win back their citizenship for them. So all sorts of incredible stories um, that, that I had no idea about, and some of them really, really very significant. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, so there's a question here from Connor. He says, uh, you're the great, great grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. Do you think that history, that history has influenced your decision to write a fact-based novel on World War II? 
Yeah, I think it did. I mean, I've been thinking about how that that family connection makes me think or feel differently about these issues. Mm -hmm. And the answer that I've come up with is I feel maybe a stronger identification with the government than most people do. Um, and so I said before, you know, my narrator is supposed to be like me in some ways and that he really trusts the government, at least at the beginning. He starts out thinking, you know, the government is us. The government is the good guys. Of course, they're not going to do anything wrong. And I really felt that way, too. I felt that, you know, the United States government, it's a democracy. It represents us. What it does, it does in our name. It reflects our values. It acts consistently with those values. And it was kind of a painful process for me to learn that that was not necessarily true. And the lesson that I've come away with about that is the government is actually not America. You know, America is the American people. Our government can do bad things. Our government can make mistakes. Doesn't mean that we're a bad country. I believe that we, the American people, are good. I believe America is a great country. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that because it's America, whatever the government does is right. Mm. So are you planning on writing any more novels in the future or maybe something in a similar sort of vein? And is there anything you're working on right now or something specific that you have planned for next? I'm definitely planning on writing more novels in the future. I don't know if I'm going to do historical fiction again because it, it turned out to be so difficult to just confidently improvise scenes because I, mm -hmm. I felt like I had to check every fact that I was describing. Mm -hmm. So. My solution to this, actually, what, what I'm thinking about for the next novel was to write something that's in part very autobiographical so that all the details are very familiar to me and then in part fantasy so that I can just make things up and not worry about getting it wrong. So what I'm thinking about right now is a novel about a law professor, a young law <laughs> professor with a family, and then it's going to have fantasy elements. It will involve mm. demons, oh. literal demons, sort of biblical demons. Wow. It's a, departure. it's a departure from the previous books, but it seems it seems to me like it's a very interesting way to explore some themes. One of the things that I was trying to do in this book, in Allegiance, was tell a story about a particular episode in our constitutional history that I think illustrates some important themes, and then mm -hmm. have a fictional plot, my murder mystery, my conspiracy, that also illustrates those same themes. And I'm hoping to do sort of the same thing with the book that I'm thinking about now, which is there will be fantasy elements, but they'll be there to highlight or replay certain themes that are that are from the non-fantasy plot. Mm, right. Wow, very cool. So, um, have you always been interested in in law and sort of American history, and what um, what kind of sparked this interest for you? Well, you know, it was actually accidental in a lot of ways. It was actually accidental in a lot of ways. Sorry, my computer just went to sleep. Oh, okay. um, I don't know if you lost me or not. You probably did, but I'm back. Oh, no. um, what happened was I was I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate, and my, my interests at the time were philosophy and literature. I wanted to be a novelist or a philosophy professor, and my parents were not enthusiastic about that idea. And they said, <laughs> why don't you go to law school instead? Right? You go to law school, you can still teach, but you don't have to spend as much time getting a PhD. If you get a teaching job, you'll be working on things that people actually care about, unlike philosophy, no offense to my philosophy professor friends. <laughs> and you know, if you don't get a teaching job, your degree will be worth something, which is not so true of a philosophy PhD. So I went to law school thinking about teaching. And actually what I was thinking about teaching was tax, because people said to me, there's always a shortage of tax professors. You know, That's your best way to get a teaching job. Mm -hmm. Then. After my Supreme Court clerkship, people were more willing to take me seriously as a constitutional law expert than as a tax expert because I didn't have any tax experience. So I ended up in constitutional law um, almost by accident, really. I mean, I'm very glad that I did because I, I do think that these are very important, crucial issues that I, I really feel honored and I enjoy working about on and thinking about. But you know, I, if you look back, it's, it's a whole strange series of coincidences, really. Wow, what, that's a great story. <laughs> um, so we have another question here from Emily. Um, who are some of your writing influences, and do you have any authors that really inspire you? 
I do. I have all sorts of authors that inspire me, although in different ways and at, at different times. So back when I was in college, well, I could start in high school, I guess. In high school, I was a big Fitzgerald fan. And I tried to write these sort of lyrical, poignant stories in the style of Escott Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. Then in college, I got more into Nabokov and Joyce. And I tried to write really fancy, awe-inspiring sentences. Mm. And, you know, of course, nothing, nothing that I wrote during this period ended up getting published, which is probably for the best. Um, <laughs> And then I started also Milam Kundera, I guess. I was trying to write philosophically deep, awe-inspiring sentences, right? Which is a great thing if you can do it, but not everyone can do it. And for many people, mm -hmm. it's probably not what you should be trying to do. Mm -hmm. So then after I graduated from law school, I started trying to write something that would appeal to people more, you know, something that people would enjoy reading more. And I started thinking more in sort of like Scott Turow legal thriller vein, which is how I came up with my first novel. What I was trying to do there, I usually, when I'm writing a novel, I, I think of it as this book I like, but in the style of some other author that I like. Mm. So my first novel, In the Shadow of the Law, was supposed to be a Scott Turow legal thriller, but written more in the style of Jonathan Franzen. I was thinking of like the Jonathan Franzen, the corrections, where you've got mm. this kind of insightful social commentary while you're telling a story about characters that people will care about. So that's what I was trying to do within the shadow of the law. Um, Allegiance, I was trying to do something like War and Remembrance, if you know Herman Wouk, War, War and Remembrance, mm -hmm. in the style of Robert Penn Warren. So I wanted to write a book that gives you a lot of historical information, which is what War and Remembrance does, but also mm -hmm. does so in a less dry, more lyrical, more emotional, more evocative way. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so on this topic of sort of writing and reading, um, what have you learned about writing historical fiction and legal thrillers? And do you have any advice for aspiring writers of these genres? Well, I've learned a bunch of things. I mean, I learned first that writing historical fiction is hard. I didn't realize how hard it would be. And it's hard in a couple of different ways. One is it's very constraining. And one of the things that I had to do as I was going through and revising was just say, forget it. I'm gonna stop looking things up. I'm gonna make this the story that it needs to be to be a good story. And I'm not gonna worry obsessively about historical accuracy. And you can do that, I think, when you're revising because you're not making the, the really major changes. The other thing that I learned, though, was when you're doing the research, you're inevitably gonna come across hundreds and hundreds of things that are fascinating to you and would also be fascinating to anyone who's so steeped in the historical research, but are not necessarily gonna be interesting to the general reader. So basically my process was, I did all this research, I found all these facts and events that I thought were, were really interesting. I put them all in the book. And then during the you know three or four years I spent revising it, I gradually took out the things that actually held back the narrative and I pared back on the research. So. I think probably that's a good way to do it. And, you know, it's sort of like an iceberg, they say. Um, you know, only 10% of the iceberg is visible, and that's what your research is like. You'll do a lot of research. You'll write down an enormous number of things. Then you have to really pare it away to the 10% that works as fiction also. Mm. So In the Shadow of the Law, your previous novel, um, was almost turned into a TV series in 2006. So what was that experience like? And um, are you interested in having any of your work made into a movie or a TV series in the future? Oh, absolutely. I'm interested. For anyone out there who wants to buy the rights, just get in touch. Um, I mean, the, the experience was wonderful. It was really amazing. I worked with Carol Mendelson. Mm -hmm. She was going to be the showrunner. This was going to be a show for CBS. So Paramount bought the rights. Carol Mendelson wrote a pilot episode. We cast it, and I thought we got an incredible cast. We had Joshua Jackson as the lead. We had Frank Langella. We had Alan Tudyk, who was on Firefly. Um, and then a lot of the dialogue really came straight from the book. So I got to see people bringing to life the characters and the scenes and the, the words that I had written, which was just amazing. I really enjoyed it. I was, I was unhappy that CBS didn't end up ordering the series. But we did get to film the pilot, and that was an amazing experience. 
So do you watch any law shows on TV right now, or are there any that you want to see? I know there's a ton on, so. I don't watch a lot of TV just because with, with two young kids, there's not a lot of time. And then when I do watch TV, a lot of it has been My Little Pony, things like that, <laughs> uh, which, which I think is a great show for adults, too. But I probably wouldn't be watching it if I hadn't had a seven-year-old daughter. Mm. Um, I, I have lately been watching How to Get Away with Murder, mm. in part just because that's supposed to be set at Penn. It's set at some law school in Philadelphia. It does not actually resemble... Penn Law or the legal system at all, but it's an entertaining show. Huh. Very cool. Um, so then last sort of part of this interview, I kind of we're kind of doing this thing where I'm they're called rapid fire questions, where I ask you a few questions. I know it sounds scary, it's really not. Lightning round. Um, yeah, <laughs> lightning round. So it's kind of um either or questions and you just can answer the first thing that comes into your head. Sound good? Sure. <laughs> okay, ready? Ready. Fiction or, fiction or non-fiction? Fiction. Books or movies? Books. Writing by hand or typing? Typing. Road trips or traveling by plane? Traveling by plane. Mystery or adventure? Mystery. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Night owl. Great. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, so I think that's about all the time we have for today. Do you have anything else you want to kind of let the vis um, people watching know? Or um, thank you all for watching. Yeah. That's thank you for th thank you for talking to us today. This was really great, really informative and interesting. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. And thank you, and thank you again for everyone joining us. Um, and make sure to check out Allegiance. All right. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you.